Well, hello, hello again. This is Jack Sheffield, Jack the Exam Guy, talking to you about the Principles and Practices of Commercial Construction 10th Edition. I still remember uh, when I took my first building contractor's exam. I didn't study all that hard, and uh, but I knew I'm a pretty good test taker, so I could use the indexes and do the best I could. Um, one of my strategies, since I, by looking at this book, I saw that it was a had a great index, that um, if I had no clue of where to go, I'd say, okay, well, let's try principles and practices of commercial construction. And because uh, I know it's got a good index, if it's in that book, it'll, I'll probably find it pretty quick. And if it's not, well, at least I could eliminate this particular manual as being the source. So, you know, you might want to employ that um, or you might study more than I did. But uh, either way, we're going to go through this book and um, it's got a lot of great information. You're going to once we get start going through this information, it's just going to make you want to jump up and uh, go out and build something. I got to tell you. <clears throat> You know, if you're in the if you're in the construction business, it actually is some great uh, great information in here. Kind of give you if you don't do a lot of commercial work, it gets you gives you some uh, you know some 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 great insight into what's going on on those commercial jobs. If you don't do construction at all in the field, well, you know you know be prepared to learn something. But this is going to be pretty detailed. This is going to take a while, so get comfortable. All right. The first thing we're going to do, we're going to be on page 14. We're going to be talking about the nature of soil. There is a uh, there's a section here on the right-hand uh, side on page 14 that talks about the different soil types and the different sizes, so I'd make sure I can find that. And at the very bottom, it talks about cohesionless soils and what have you. Can you see that? Okay. Cohesionless soils, cohesive soils, miscellaneous soils, and so on and so forth are, you know, different, different classifications. So, you know, there's just all, you know, um, <clears throat> fair game for test questions. All right. Page 15. This is going to be a very important um, table for you to find this bearing of soils, the relative bearing strength of soils, and it's in pounds per square foot. We're not going to be doing much metric on this exam. And then we're going to be talking about, uh, says here on the bottom right, on page 15, to control the amount of settlement, it's recommended that the fill, when you're doing fill, you put them, you put the layers in not more than six inches and you're going to compact each layer. That's what they recommend. Okay, and the course is not always done like that, but principles and practice is probably a little bit higher standard than what you, what you might find in a, some of the manuals. Okay. Um, just as a side note, once again, this book is allowed to be taken into the exam. This is a new, um, this is a a, a, a a new development for 2023. I am recording this in May of 2023, so this is all fairly new. If you are under the impression that this book is not allowed into the exam, well, <clears throat> I've got some news for you. It is, and I would almost uh, uh, encourage you to print up the list of manuals allowed into the exam um, because if you get there and they tell you you can't bring this in you need to have some documentation backing that up you know when things change a lot of times that information doesn't always filter down to who it needs to get to you know that um, so think about that <clears throat> and in my course i do have um, a pdf that you can print up that has the list of manuals okay the shelby two at the bottom right of page 16. This is all about doing this subsurface ex, uh, exploration, so make sure you can find what's going on with that Shelby tube, what's going on with that split spoon sampler down there at the bottom right on page 16. And when we're doing that soil exploration, you know, subsurface exploration on page 17, they call it, you can use a manual or a hand auger for, for, for uh, shallow excavations. You can go power augers for deeper depths. You can go to, you can use a test pit, and guess what? That's the best method. Okay, you might want to know that at some point in the future. The wash boring method uses water, turns your sample into mud. Not all that great. All right, let's cruise on through here. We're, you know, this takes us, uh, starts at the beginning, talk about soil, and then we're going to go on to uh, 
site evaluation. But before we get out of soil, we're going to talk about that modified proctor test, which is on page 25. You might want to hit the pause button, do a little and read about that. And you can do that anytime during this video, obviously. Hit the pause button and get yourself a little deeper uh, you know, explanation of that of the particular uh, subject. Modified proctor is what everybody uses now, by the way. Okay, that's what you need to know. And then we're going to the topographic survey, and they talk about them uh, right on page thirty about the, you know, the latest generation of survey equipment um, is electronic. You know, it's got this micro microchip technology, and so on and so forth. So anything about a leveling equipment is going to be in this section, especially right here. This theodolite. I want you to be able to know that a theodolite rotates 360 degrees in a vertical plane. It's also horizontal. It doesn't say that here, but it's horizontal as well. So make sure that you make a note of that. And um, page 35, layout before excavation, the boundaries on the, it talks about monuments. That's what you need to know. That's what the survey has put monuments down. That's what you're going to use. That's what you're going to uh, use as your reference point. Okay. Interesting little concept on the bottom of page 38. You know, when you're building a building, you're going to dig a footer. You actually got to dig a little bit wider than what the footer is going to be sometimes. Okay. Especially if you're going to be doing forms and forming up walls. So the, you, so the, um, <clears throat> what they, uh, they've got a concept that says generally, you know, the excavation is going to extend two feet beyond the actual building itself. And because the excavator has to be paid for that extra, um, uh, excavations. They call it the pay line. Okay, might want to make a note of that. Let's cruise on through. We've got some good diagrams here that you can always take a look at if you like. Spend some time there. I don't really suggest it because you've got a lot of information to go through and I'm pointing out the most important that you need to, that you need to uh, pay attention to. So you just cruise on through this manual with me as we get to the most, to the next important concept. And we're going to be on page 71 in chapter four. And as we flip over to page 72, we're going to be talking about removing groundwater. Okay. That can be done through pumps. It can be done through perimeter trenching, or it can be done through a dewatering system using well pumps. You know, whenever I see three or four things, uh, uh, I think of a negative question. All of the following are methods of removing groundwater, except then they're going to throw something else in there. So think about those negative questions. They can kind of, you know, when you're tired and you're taking that exam, they can kind of turn your head around. You got to make sure you're make sure you're wide awake for this thing. <clears throat> OK, so we're going to be on page 76. And we're going to be talking, you know, about this concept called bank cubic yards. So if something's in bank, you know, this the, the, the soil is in bank, it hasn't fluffed yet. It hasn't expanded because that will happen when you dig, you know, do excavations. And then you have loose cubic yards after you excavate it. OK, and then um, and then you have a the soil, the soil swell is what creates the loose cubic yards. It gets bigger. And these are your typical uh, soil swells there at the bottom page uh, 76 table four dash one. Make sure that you can find that. All right. On page 80, there's two basic types of cranes, your stationary and your tower. Um, then you've got your mobile cranes. Um, Actually, it says stationary and mobile. Sorry about that. The stationary is a tower crane. And then the mobile crane is a crawl, or you have crawlers and truck cranes for your mobile cranes. All right, very good. We're going to go over to page 83, and we're going to be talking about the gantry. And there's a there's a picture of it right there. It, it uh, provides better boom support, so that's interesting right there. Make sure you can take a look at that. You've got something called a jib. Okay, so make sure that you understand what the jib is. You can read about that if you want to hit that pause button. Most of us may know what a jib is anyway. Okay, and at the top of page 84, it talks about the load of the capacity of a crane depends on all the following. Yeah, you might get a question about that. All right, so we're going to go over to page 87. 
And at the very last sentence says, the size of an excavator shall be selected for any particular job based on all of those. You might want to make a note of that. Very good. Okay. Um, on page 93, they talk about cycle time and production. I'm not going to spend a lot of time right now because I'm going to have you a, a video on how to do this calculation. And uh, this is probably not the appropriate time. We're trying to get through this, uh, this manual. But you'll have a separate video um, on cycle time and production and what have you. Okay, so we're going to be over to page 97. Now, sometimes it could, you won't have to do a calculation. It just may be a matter of pulling a number off of a table. So this is a shovel, so a.k.a. backhoe, okay? And it's got your dipper size, a.k.a. bucket size, right, in cubic yards. So you've got your cubic yards, you've got your material, and then that number in the chart is your hourly production. Good thing to be able to, to know. Um, someday in the future, while you're sitting in front of a computer terminal going, oh my God, what have I gotten myself into? And then you go to page 104, and you've got uh, you've got some shoring going on. The only reason I want you to know this is if you're not familiar with shoring operations, or this actually reminds me of when I was building docks. We call this sheeting, which is fairly self-explanatory. This horizontal, the 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 um, the member that's perpendicular to your vertical sheeting is called a whale. We called them whalers. <clears throat> Didn't know any better. Bob Marley kind of thing going on there. And then you've got some cross braces. So just a little bit of terminology there with a little diagram to, uh, to help you out. You got some blasting principles on page 109. I've never done any blasting myself, but if you want to know about that, if you get any questions about blasting, it's all in this next few pages. And then there's some safety rules. Yes, yes, you might. They might ask you about some safety rules with regard to blasting. Okay, now we're going to look at foundations. Okay, we might use piles. I'm on page 115. We might use some piles for some foundations here. Okay, um, wood, steel, concrete. You have, now here's what's really important. You have bearing, bottom right, bearing, friction, friction plus bearing, and sheet piling. Okay, so those are the four types of piles. You know, we have a wood pile here, typical part of a pile at the uh, on page 116. Just make sure you know you have tip. Now, this one particularly, this one has a pile shoe. Uh, never used a pile shoe myself, but, um, you know, apparently, you know, that you kind of protect the piling while you're driving that pile, especially a wood piling going through some pretty heavy duty, uh, heavy duty soil. There you go. Uh, of course, you got the butt, you got the tip and so on and so forth. The top that you're going to cut off is called the cutoff. Imagine that. Okay. So you have the bearing capacity of a pile. This is a, um, this is a calculation that I don't want you to pay attention to. And the answer, why do you ask? And the, an the, the answer is this was done by an engineer. And engineers, they do calculations a little bit different than those in the rest in the real world. Okay, and I have a video and practice questions which are going to take you through this in a more, much more um, understandable way. And but it is something you need to know. It's it, it's the it's called the uh, the capacity of a pile. You want to know the bearing. You want to know the shear. Okay, bearing uh, capacity plus the shear capacity equals the total capacity. And um, got a great video for you if you haven't seen it already. Okay, wood piles, page 117. Okay, tells you about they come in lengths of 12 inches. The minimum tip is about 6 inches, and they get up to about 20 inches in diameter on the butt. That's about right. <clears throat> okay, and then you've got the advantage of, of wood piles. Okay, they're light. All right, whoever wrote this hasn't actually tried to pick up a wood pile, apparently. But you know what? In comparison, they are light. Concrete are much heavier. Steel piles could be much heavier in, uh, you know, when you compare it to the uh, other piles that is actually 
uh, correct. Okay, so we're going to keep going through. We're talking about piles. We've got to drive that pile. All right, pile drivers mate. You can have a drop hammer. You can have a mechanical hammer. You can have a vibratory hammer. All right, all kind of good stuff about your hammers right there. Um, let's see here. As we go through... There's actually a question in the walkers. I think it's in the walkers. I don't think it's here, which talks about how much, what the uh, what the hammer should weigh in, a, in 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 terms of the piling itself. And we'll talk about that when we go when when we talk about the walkers a little bit. I don't believe it is in this book though, but there is a question, so you might want to just kind of tuck that away and make sure that you get that later. Um, how how heavy the drop hammer should be in relation to, I believe it's a third, but we'll verify that. Um, so here we go. We're going to go and talk about some form work on page 37. But before we go on to foundations, I am going to show you something in the walkers here because intermittently in this video, I think I'm going to do that because... Remember, the Walker's Builder's Estimator's Reference Book you can't bring in. So, I did want to show you where it does say, now I'm in the 31st edition. They do have a 32nd edition out now, but these things, the information doesn't change. They just rearrange it and charge you for a book. So, I don't have the 32nd, but I have the 31st here. And if you want to find the page number in the 32nd, you can. You're just going to have to go to the index and look under pile driving. But uh, so here we go. Um, it does say that the weight, the drop hammer, the weight of a drop hammer should be about one third the weight of the pile to be driven. Wow, I can remember a thing or two at 61 years old. That's awesome. Okay, so now we'll set that aside. And my dog's going to bark in the middle of this. Uh, shh. Lay down. In the middle of this, but that's okay. She just wants to be heard too. All right, so we're talking about some form work here. Um, and this is interesting. There's some interesting stuff because what happens is when you put this fresh concrete against forms, there's going to be, you know, some pressure. There's going to be on the form work itself. And sometimes we need to calculate that because we have to build our form work strong enough, all right, to, uh, you know, to, to compensate for some things with the, uh, with the, uh, with the concrete. Now, what you got to realize is that that's enough. What you have to realize is that the the rate of placement affects your, the rate of uh, placement is going to affect the pressure on the forms. The faster you put it in, you know, it's going to, it's going to dry as you put it in. So if you put it in slow, it's not going to affect, you know, the, the, the pressure on the forms. If you put it in fast, you're going to, you know, it's gonna, you're going to have more pressure on the forms, right? So the rate of placement effects and also the temperature, because remember, the warmer it is, the faster the, the concrete is going to set up. So your temperature and your rate of placement is going to affect the pressure of the form on the wall of the, of the, uh, concrete on the wall form. So you got a table right there at the bottom of page 142 that kind of tells you a little bit about that. So you may want to be able to find that. Okay. Pulling numbers off of tables are great test questions because it's just like, boom, there's the answer. I don't have to look at it. I don't have to search and search and search for it. Okay. Um, and speaking of, when this one's a little trickier though, um, it's going to be on page 151 and 152. Now, so you've got some different things, symbols used in formwork. So we're going to need to know these if we're going to know how to read this table. So you have a compression parallel to the grain. You have a modulus of elasticity. You have a bending stress and you have a horizontal shear stress. And, you know, this is engineer speak. But you know what? All we have to do is... Um, 
is, is get the number off the table to pass this exam. And then we can go on about the rest of our life, right? So that's what we're going to do here. That kind of, This question is going to look so complicated. They're going to be talking about a million and a half and 1,923 and all this stuff. And all you got to realize is it's right here. Okay, it's right here on page 152. We're talking about safe spacing of support. So we're supporting those forms. The forms are made out of plywood. You know, the plywood is continuous over four or more supports. So they're going to tell you all this in the question, something similar to that. Or it could be another table where you only have two ports, uh, uh, points of support or something. Just make sure that whatever's in the question lines up with, you know, what the table is talking about. And then they're going to tell you this 19, you know, the, uh, the 1930 PSI and the million and a half PSI and then the rolling shear. They're going to give you all that. So you're going to say, oh, yeah, I remember that. That's what Jack was telling me about on that exam, all these weird things. But it's really going to be easy because then we only have to know is the plywood, is the sanded thickness of the plywood, the face grain, is it parallel or is it perpendicular? What are they telling us in the test question? Well, if they're telling us it's par uh, parallel, then we obviously use uh, this, this portion of the table here and so forth. So it's just a matter of, it seems like it's a super complicated question, but it's actually pretty easy. And you just got to make sure you're using the right table and pull the number off of it, right? We can do this. Not a big deal. Okay, so here's our, this is all about formwork, all these tables about the stress. So just make sure that you can know the pressure on the formwork. So just make sure that you can find it. Yeah, buddy. All right, I got a dog chasing a cat over here. We're trying to get the, we're trying to get this new chocolate lab puppy who's, uh, about a year old used to our cats who are about eight years old and they are just not getting along very good okay on page 201 wow we've made it about halfway through this book now we're on page 201 all right we're talking about flying forms okay you kind of get a picture of what's going on so when you're building apparently haven't really done one myself but when you're building a multi-story concrete structure Apparently, you're using the same form from, you know, from unit to unit and from story to story. It's, it's, the same, it's the same thing over and over again. So they have something called a flying form. They don't have to build the form and tear it down every time. They just take a crane and move the form into place and then take and move the form out of place. Seems like a pretty complicated procedure to me, but they call it a flying form. Okay. All right. Don't you just want to go out there and build something now? This is really getting, this is getting the juices flowing. We want to get out there and build something. Okay, but you can't yet. All right, you got to pass this exam first. I'm helping you do that here. Sit tight. All right, page 206. Uh, concrete work. We talk about the aggregates. All right, we talk about different, uh, different aggregates and so on and so forth. By the way, <clears throat> it is so good that you can take this book in now. This is going to make a big difference. Um, because there's a lot, I hear a lot from people about how many concrete questions are on this exam. And then, you know, uh, you've got that design and control of concrete mixture. So a lot of stuff that's in design and control of concrete mixtures is in this book, which is great because you can take this book in now. Uh, there's a few things that I am going to go over later, or maybe even a little bit in this exam, in, in this presentation, that are in design and control of concrete mixtures that are not in this book. But this is where you're going to get and look for your concrete questions. Okay, so they do talk about fine aggregate means it doesn't uh, exceed a quarter inch in diameter, and then it talks about the other sizes of your aggregate up to six inches. Really? Hmm. Okay. That's a big job. All right. So your water cement ratio on page 212. Okay. The water cement ratio theory is called Abram's Law. Wow. Sounds biblical. Which says that the amount of water used per pound of cement is increased as that happens. The strength of the concrete will decrease. So if you're into concrete, if you, if you have uh, placed concrete, you know 
should know, it's easier to add water. You know, it's going to flow better and you're going to be able to move it around a little bit better, not work as hard, but you're not really supposed to do that. You're supposed to have as little water as possible. That's going to make the concrete as uh, stronger. Okay, so um, compressive strength for various water cement ratios. They give you the water cement ratio and they give you the, P uh, the, the expected PSI based on what your ratio is, and they separate it from non-entrained to entrained. Possibility you get a question. This is kind of a complicated chart here. It took me a few minutes to kind of figure out what they were talking about. 0 0.825, 0 0.75, point, and so remember, so this number goes down as, as, as the PSI go up. So that means there's less water and more cement. So this number must be the water number. And it must be, even though I don't say this, it must be this number to one. It's 0.825, lots of water to one, you're only going to get 2,000 PSI. A little bit of water, 0 0.410 to one, you're going to get a 6,000 PSI possibly. Got non-entrained versus air-entrained concrete. Interesting table there. And by the way, it's at 28 days. That is your typical um, strength test. They test the strength of concrete at 28 days. All right, something you may want to know. They may not tell you in this book, but they may tell you in the Design and Control of Concrete Mixtures. And you know what? If you were to write things like that in the right in here, probably nobody would see them. I'm not suggesting anything. It's just, just an observation. Okay, high-strength concrete. Um, on page 222, um, you've got, uh, they call it, you know, up to 6,000, they call it a uh, high strength, but you can get up to 20,000. You know, when they're building runways and things like that, it's, uh, they really use it high strength. You got something called a slump test on the bottom right on page 223. All right. It's made to check concrete has a flowability. The key word there is consistency comes up a lot. That's the slump test. If you look in your design and control of concrete mixtures, they got a picture of it. They got a cone. They got a guy pouring it. You're supposed to, by the way, on that, they don't tell you in this book, they've got like a 12 inch cone. Okay. And you're supposed to put concrete in this cone in three separate layers. And each time you put a layer in, you're supposed to take something and rot it. 25 times, put another layer in, rot it 25 times. Three times, three layers, you're supposed to rot it 25 times. That's a total of what? Can you do the math? 75 times for a slump test. And then they turn that cone, that cone over and then they see how uh, it settles. And they put a ruler on it and that's your slump. Okay. In case you didn't know that, it's an interesting thing, interesting thing. And uh, it's one of the tests that they use for freshly mixed concrete. So that's a slump test. And then they have a compression test on page 225. This is what's done at 28 days. All right. And I, here it is right here. Okay. It is on page 224, 28 days. And then they take other tests at one, three, or seven days. Now, seven days is really the more common one. And what I want you to know, and I want, I'm going to write, I'm going to write it here in my book. You can do it if you want to or not. As a matter of fact, I'm going to do that right now. Seven days equals 75 percent of what you're going to get at 28 days. Okay, so don't do what I do now because you might get caught when you get into the test. All right, transit mixer. All right, transit mixer. Concrete provided under this process is ready mixed concrete. Sure, it's going to go 70 to 100 times to get, uh, um, to, uh, to get, get fully mixed. Um, no more than 300 total. Okay. Each drum mixer has a revolution counter and total revolutions, including mixing and transit, should not exceed 300. You know, when you see it going down the road, that's not the mixing speed. That's the uh, travel speed, the transit speed, okay? And, you know, when they get it to the job site, they usually speed it back up to get it mixed again good, maybe put a little bit of more water in it, that kind of thing. 
ASTMC94. That's the standard that somebody may ask you about one day in the future while you're sitting in front of a computer terminal. That's the standard for ready mix concrete, ASTMC94. All right, and they'll tell you, they should tell you somewhere that from the time you put the water in until the time you discharge it at the site, it's an hour and a half. It's 90 minutes maximum. Does it say that in here anywhere? It may not, but I tell you where it does say it. It says it in the design and control of concrete mixtures. I actually think it's in here somewhere. So we're talking about pumping concrete here. Oh, here it is right here. There's your hour and a half on page 233. Um, and uh, so the, on page 232, they're talking about concrete pumps, right? Um, three types, piston, pneumatic, and squeeze pressure pumps. Three kinds. Remember, there's three things there. It's always that. Always think of that negative question. Which of the following is not a type of pneumatic pump for concrete or just pump for concrete concrete pump there's your hour and a half there's your transit mix size on page 233 there is your uh, mixing at 50 to 100 revolutions i think before it said 70 or something like that these numbers you know they're not etched in stone 70 to yeah back on 228 they said 70 to 100 you know um but uh but you get the idea. This is where you're going to find your questions about concrete. A lot of them. Okay. There's also one, you know, seawater. There is a, if you, you know, seawater. If you're going to be doing some marine construction, you're going to use something called tricalcium aluminate. And you're going to get four to 10%. Just thought I'd write that in there. Okay. Why did I want to do that? I don't know. Just had a feeling I might need it at some point in the future. Concrete should be placed in wall forms in thin layers or lifts, 12 to 18 inches, we're told here. Okay. And uh, shotcrete. And we're going to talk a little bit about shotcrete. We're moving on to shotcrete. This is what they do for swimming pools. That's where you see it mostly, where they where they blast it into the, into the wall there doesn't have to have a super high amount of strength just to uh just you know for a swimming pool and so uh you can add the air to it you can blast it against the uh against your screen there and have yourself a nice little uh, nice little swimming pool there you go they're at 245 they're shooting some right there okay we'll move on to water content normal right here to page 248 Concrete made from normal density aggregates with three quarter inch maximum size aggregate will require 310 to 360 pounds of water. Okay, I'm going to write something else down right here. I'm going to say normal weight concrete weighs 150 pounds per square foot. Approximately could could change, but uh, might be something that you might want to know one day. All right, so we're going to be on page two fifty one, and this is what they call a welded wire mesh (WWM) welded wire reinforcement. It's usually you know if you see this WWM. That's what they're talking about. Welded wire mesh, six by six, 10, 10. What that means, just think about, you've probably seen it on a job site, even if you haven't poured concrete. It's uh, it's steel, it's a mesh. It's uh, uh, almost looks like a fence or something like that. A typical designation is six by six, 10, 10. First two numbers are the spacing. Okay, so there's six inches by six inches on your spacing of your wires. And then the 10, Okay, is the gauge. All right, there you go. I guess there's two numbers on the gauge. I guess the uh, wires run on one way could be one gauge and the wires run on the other way could be the other gauge, but it doesn't matter. You don't really need to know that for the exam. You just need to know that that second number is the gauge. That's that last number. First two numbers are the size of the mesh. The last number is the gauge of the steel. Okay, rebar. This is good to know right here. It's good to know this is here. You know, you got a rebar book. 
can't bring it in. Okay, so you're going to find some uh, interesting things about rebar here um, that you might want to know. Okay, so we have the size. Okay, the size, by the way, you may not even have to look it up. Just remember the number is the diameter in eighths of an inch. So four eighths is half an inch. Eight eighths is one inch in diameter, right? And it's got the area and even the weight. This is good to know because maybe you're doing a set of plans, right? Um, maybe you're doing a set of plans and they want to know how much rebar, what the weight of the rebar is. So you can figure up all your rebar and what have you. But if you didn't know how much it weighed, you know, with regard to the size, then you, you wouldn't be able to figure it out. But this is a good page to be able to find your rebar <clears throat> weights, areas, diameter. Okay. And then you have, um, these are good here. Now this used to be in the code book but they don't put it in the code book anymore. They just say ACI 318. They really wimped out on you on that because years ago, they used to tell you all this thing in the code book, three inches. If you're going to uh, concrete cast, uh, mm. cast concrete against the earth, you want three inches of concrete cover around your rebar. That makes sense. You don't want that stuff to rust. Now, if it's not cast against the earth, it's just exposed to earth or weather. Okay, then it's going to be, you, it, depending on the size, you could have a two inch cover for a six through 18. You could have an inch and a half cover for number fives and smaller. It kind of depends there. Okay, so you've got some different things that you uh, that you need to know, which is important about rebar. There's some also some other things that you need to know. And one of the things is about corrosion resistance. Corrosion resistance, you can go, it can be two ways. It can be galvanized or it can be epoxy, okay? Now, epoxy is generally green on the job site, um, but the question is really tricky because it talks about green epoxy and it talks about galvanized, okay? Um, it's the, it's, it's the, the galvanized is what you're going to want to look for as far because they don't say epoxy they just say galvanized so ga and, and i don't think i've ever seen galvanized rebar tell you the truth but galvanized is corrosion resistant epoxy is corrosion resistant as well but it's green but if they don't say epoxy if they just say green then be very careful about that also repair Okay, let's say that your epoxy came to the job damaged. The maximum amount that you can do on a repair on the job site is 1%. Okay, so just think about that. You don't have to write these down. I don't want to get you in trouble. I'm writing them down because, you know, I don't mind getting in trouble sometimes. You know, I could usually talk my way out of it. But, you know, maybe they'll just make you, uh, you know, uh, take a magic marker and put over it or something like that. I would not recommend that you write in here like I am. Okay, but these are things that you're going to want to, you know, tuck away in the back of your mind somewhere because you may be asked about that. The maximum repair, okay, of epoxy and what the corrosion resistance is as well. Those are in that uh, that rebar book. And while we're talking about it, I want to go ahead and break out that rebar book. All right, so here we go. I'm on page 18-6. Chapter 18 is about coated reinforcing steel. And then we're going to look at zinc coated. Okay, zinc coated, ASTM. It's got your design standard and so forth. I don't think you're going to have to remember that. Um, uh the project specs should contain any special requirements for galvanized and so on and so forth. So galvanized is an accepted way to have corrosion resistance for your rebar. Also epoxy coated. Okay. It's furnished sheets, yada, yada, yada. There's also, like I said, this repair. So the repair issue is in here as well. And here it is right here on page 18-2 of your rebar book. It says project specifications should limit the amount of repair damage to less than 1% of the surface area per foot of each coated bar. All right. 
So there we go. And the other thing I wanted to point out to you on page is in chapter seven, and it has to do with deformed bars. Guess what? The bars are deformed on purpose. It helps the uh, it helps the bar grab the concrete better, right? Now you do have plain bars, okay? Now they can be used as dowels, maybe an expansion joint, okay? Um, but uh, just want to point a point a point a few things uh, out to you in this book, the rebar book. There you go. You get a little bonus here. You get, you're getting a bonus. All right. So we're going to cruise on through, see if we can. Are you getting tired yet? I'm not. No, no. We're going to make it through this book. We're going to do well. Let's see. We're talking. <laughs> girl. That'll wake you up if you are tired. How about that? Yes, she was a good girl. She was letting me know there was somebody here that shouldn't have been here. Oh, she's a good girl. Okay. We're going to be on page 277, tilt-up load-bearing wall panels. Okay, so we're looking at tilt-up construction. What I want you to know, there's a word in here called panels. It is a panelized type of construction. Tilt-up. Probably seen it. Okay. All right, so we're going to go to page 283, and we're going to be talking about masonry construction. I want you to see this is a CMU. If you did not realize, that's what they call it, a concrete masonry unit. Probably seen a million of them, okay, and it's got the size. This is your standard size CMU. 15 and 3 eighths long, 7 and 5 eighths high, and the width, it depends, the width is also 7 and 5 eighths as well. It gives you this gives you this uh, this table that's your typical cmu why is it three eighths of an inch smaller than eight by 16 well because you got three eighths inches of mortar that goes in between obviously and so when you are figuring out how many cmus that you need you got to figure on eight by 16 now remember even if it's a four inch wide cmu it's still eight by 16 on the face so when you're figuring out your calculations, you're generally going to use the 8 by 16. Or, remember this, 1.125. All right. When you figure out your square footage of a wall, you multiply, multiply, make sure you multiply. A lot of people want to divide. You multiply your square footage times 1.125 because it takes 1.125 CMUs to fill a square foot. This is a one, this is eight by 16, 128 square inches. It is not as much as 144 square inches, which is a square foot. So there you go. All right. So we got some other sizes. We got two bonds, two different types of bonds, a running and a stack. You're seeing a stack at the bottom of page 285 where they line up. Okay. Running st or stagger. All right. So we're going to go on. We're going to move on a little bit here. We're going to move on to, let's see, let's see. Okay, mortar. All right, so you got your types of mortar, and you have the PSI of that mortar. All right, that's in the walkers as well, but remember, you can't bring that walkers in, so that's really good. I want you to know a Flemish bond and an English bond. Yeah. Make sure that you can find those and take a look at them. You might have to do that sometime in the future. Somebody might ask you about the difference between a Flemish and an English bond. Okay. All right. So I'm sure there's a joke there about Flemish bonds and English bonds, but I won't, uh, I won't do that to you. Okay. Page 311, structural timber frame. Okay. The structural frame, right-hand column, two-thirds of the way down capable of resisting. So you, here's what they're talking about. Here's what I want you to know. I want you to know the difference between a dead load and a live load. That's where the rubber meets the road when it comes to passing this exam. Remember, dead loads go into the building. They're going to stay there. Live loads are going to change based on how many people, maybe wind loads, maybe things that are going to change, okay, over time. Um, and I've got a video which takes you through that. So you might want to make sure that if you haven't seen that already, that you watch that. There'd be a calculation. They're going to tell you how much the, uh, you know, how many beams there are and, 
you know, what the beams weigh and, and the, you know, and so forth. You have to, you have to differentiate between what is a live load, live load and what is a dead load. Page 329, they begin a discussion of glue laminated beams, and um, it uh, might be important for you to be able to find this. There's different things that they do with glue laminated beams. These might look like trusses, but they're actually glue lamb beams on page 331. And on 330, the second paragraph, they discuss the three hinged arch. Okay, could have legs that are straight and so on and so forth. And they've got a couple here. They got a low and a high, but three hinged. It must be one, two, three, three hinged arch. One, two, three. They also have that in a truss as well. And we'll talk about trusses here in a few minutes. Now, these are put together with glue. All right. Now, it used to tell us the different types of glue melamine glucosamine and chondroitin something like that no, of course not that's a that's a, <clears throat> that's what comes in uh, 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 vitamins but casein okay casein if for moisture in high moisture environments it's case in glue that you're going to want to use and that used to be in this book and you know what happens is a lot of times they change the books but they don't change the test questions. I've seen it happen. All right. So I want you to be aware of that. Case in glue is used in glue lamb beans in a high moisture environment. All right. 341, structural steel frame. What I want you to know and what you may need to know, and it's in the walkers, but once again, you can't take the walkers in, is that steel, this is just regular old steel, not, not uh, iron or anything like that, even though there's not a whole lot of variation. Um, steel weighs 489.6 pounds per cubic foot. All right, so it's about 500 pounds. If you use 500 pounds, you'd probably be fine. But if you want to be exact, it can be 489.6. That's steel per cubic foot. Now, why is that important? Well, on plans, you may have to figure out all your beams, you know, you may have it on your columns, and then they may ask you how many tons it is or something like that. And if you don't know that number, you're going to be scratching your head. All right, so we're going to be on page 342. And th this is interesting because, you know, we always call these eye beams. Okay, they're eye beams, right? They're shaped like an eye. Well, in you know, the actual technical term is a W or an S. The S looks like main, more like the I beams, and then the W is wider. All right, so we'll look at uh, we'll look at that again in just a second here. But it's actually a W. So they call it a W fourteen by thirty two, or a W fourteen by eighty two, and so on and so forth. But what you have to know. You got to, you, you know, luckily now you can bring this book in. You can use this to help you out. The 14 is the depth of the beam. Okay. The 132 is the weight per linear foot. All right. And you've got some other things here. You've got the thickness of the steel. All right. So there's lots of good stuff here. And, um, it, you know, you need to know. You need to know these things without having to spend a lot of time looking for them because you do have limited time on these exams. You know that. Okay. So here you go. You got your S shape at the top of page 344. You got your W shape. You got your, uh, your W. You've got your channel. Okay. Make sure if you're not familiar with steel, you got to realize, okay, that's a channel. That's an angle with an equal leg. That's an unequal leg and so forth. So this might be a, a, a page you've got to reference from time to time. All right. Um, and then you have some pre-engineered steel buildings. You see that there and they, they brace them and they have these um, <clears throat> uh, beams and so on and so forth. But um, they've got advantages of your pre-engineered over a fabricated steel. So it's pre-engineered, that's the thing. And that's what you know, you'll know you see advertised as these pre-engineered steel buildings, which are great. But I wanna point out to you about something in the ocean. Now this is something that is not necessarily, doesn't jump out at you as an OSHA safety question. They ask about how many bolts that you have to have installed before you release the hoisting equipment. Well, 
you would think that it might be in here somewhere, but it's not. That's a safety issue, and it's in the OSHA. And the answer is 50%, by the way. Um, but, uh, but or it's either 50% or the number that the manufacturer recommends and the and whichever is greater so keep that in mind yeah that might be one you don't even have to look up yeah save some time to do some of that complicated math all right so here we go we're going to be on page 358 we're going to be talking about the different types of bolts this is there's three types of bolts guess what negative question all right you've got bearing and you have friction type of connections when you're using bolts you're going to drill that hole a 16th of an inch bigger okay have you ever drilled a hole exactly the same size as the bolt and then you got to get your sledgehammer and beat that thing in there you know you draw, drill that hole just a little bit bigger 16th of an inch you may even do a little bit bigger in the real world okay so we have a fillet weld and a butt weld two types of different welds there's a joke there i won't uh uh, let you 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 can um, <clears throat> you insert your own joke. All right, page three sixty five. Base plates. All right, base plates. You know that goes at the bottom of those I beams. Something that I want you to be aware of because you may have to do a calculation on uh, on your plans about a base plate. And they've got the base plate sizes there on the plans, and you just have to do the multiplication, and then you have to realize what does it what does a cubic foot of steel weigh? Because that's what they usually ask you is the weight. A cubic foot of steel weighs 489.6, is it? Yeah, okay, something like that. Somewhere around 500, just a little bit less than 500. All right, and you got these shim packs on page 365 where you're actually shimming, you know, these base plates to get them level, or you could use leveling nuts. It tells you that this, how big the shim plates usually are, so make sure you can find that. And how do you torque these babies? Okay, you can do it in three ways. You can use a pneumatic impact wrench, three ways, yeah. Um, required, uh, if, if, you, if the clutch is set. You can use a torque wrench. Look at that torque wrench. This <laughs> guys are using. Wow. And then the load indicator washers, where the washers tell you that you have the right torque. Okay. All right. There also talks about load, load indicator bolts. You might want to take a look at that as well. All right. Well, that's enough about st structural steel framing for now. We're going to talk about floors. We're getting close to the end of this book. Don't fade on me now. I do want you to know a little bit about, um, about post-tensioning versus pre-stress uh, tensioning, okay? Uh, Post-tensioning concrete slabs means you put the, uh, the reinforcement in the slab and then you place the slab in place and then you pull these, 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 these cables um, in order to give that, uh, give that um, slab uh, support. And then you have pre-tensioned where you actually, during the curing process of the concrete, force is pulled on those cables. And then when the concrete's dried, you cut the cables and then it helps hold that concrete together. So you might want to read a little bit about post-tension slabs. You might want to read a little bit about uh, pre-stressed. It's, um, it's very fascinating, fascinating stuff. Fascinating stuff. Look at what they got here. They got a picture. They got a picture right here on page 381, post tension. They got the little cables um, sticking out, and then you've got to grab those and you pull them uh, with, with jacks. Oh, they got a post tension. Go over here, bottom page 380. They also have some stuff, uh, some very interesting, fascinating, fascinating. Uh, uh, okay, so here we go. We're going to be on page 385. So you have these, this, you know, the first few times I looked at those, I didn't understand what I was looking at. But you've got these pans that you put down. And these are forms. And then you're going to pour concrete on top of here. And you're going to create these uh, these slabs, right, that look like this. Yeah, the top of page 379. You get the idea? So you're, so you're setting up all these pans. You're pouring concrete on top of it. And then, um, and then at the end, when you're done, you're going to rip all the forms out. Well, that seems like a lot of work, and it is a lot of work. But, you know, on test day, you got to know how to do it. I think in the real world nowadays, they're pre-casting uh, these at a, at a plant and hauling them to the job and putting them in place with a crane. That's probably the way it's done most of the time now. But you got to know this about know about this on exam day. And here's what I want you to know. So in in the picture on page and the picture on page 385 
they got a little flange here. So what you would have to do is you would have to nail that flange to the wooden support member, right? Okay, now here's a different way to do it. You've got a straight leg pan. Take a look at that at the top of page 386. You have a straight leg pan where, now to me, this looks like it might be easier to remove um, once your concrete is set. And what do you do? You use double headed nails so you can pull those nails out. You're gonna use double headed nails on straight leg pans. Ah. That sounds like uh, that sounds like somebody might ask you about that sometime in the future. Okay, so here we go. We've got uh, they show you, you know, a picture of the floor itself right there. Um, gives you another dimension of the uh, of the of the pan itself. I just like looking at these. They got the they they put your they they show you your rebar and what have you and your in your and your cables that are going to go in there all the next over, over the next few pages. All right, so we're going to go to page three ninety four and we're going to actually coat these floors with something epoxy and urethane. Tells us what epoxy is, and it says that on page three ninety five you're going to limit those mixes to one hundred pound batches because of the limited pot life of the mixed top. Okay, and 100 pound, 100 pound batches, okay? Because you know when you put that hardener in there, you better move quick, right? Okay, they talk about a terrazzo, all right? So make sure that you can find terrazzo floors if you get a question about terrazzo floors. And as we go on to curtain wall construction, talks about curtain wall. Okay, this is, you know, this is what they build a lot of these big high rise buildings out of now. So you build the structural frame and then you cover it with curtain walls that have no load. Uh, they don't really uh, add to the, to the strength of the structure. The development of steel and concrete, multi-story led to the adoption of non-load bearing exterior walls known as curtain walls. That's what you got to know to pass this exam. Okay. All right. Yes, we're getting close to the end here. We're talking about building insulation a little bit, commercial insulation. Now, what happens is it's, they also talk about fireproofing. So when you're putting these beams in, you can build these forms and you can actually pour concrete, cellular concrete in here as insulation and fireproofing for your I-beams. And you can also use gypsum wallboard. I'm on page 422 and 423 in the 10th edition here of the Principles and Practices of Commercial Construction. Yes, sir, Bob. All right, well, let's flip on through. Let's see if my dog's gonna bark again. She just got out and went to the door. Okay, so brace yourself. Brace yourself. All right. There's in here. There's not a lot to not more in here. But what I do want to do is I want to find the section on trusses because it's very important. So we're almost done here. So just bear with me for another moment or so. I do want to talk about trusses. I'm on page 446 of the 10th edition of the Principles and Practices of Commercial Construction. So these are all some configurations of trusses. All right. You have a king post, which I want you to find. Now, why do I have these two X'd out and why do I have these two lines? And I'll tell you why. It's because I'm going to introduce this. This is the Walker's 31st edition again on page 654. They talk about trusses as well. Now remember, you can't take this in. All right. But I did want to point out to you because it shows the arrows here of where the bearing is on a king post truss. So they don't have the, the other diagonal web members on this truss. They just have the one in the middle, hence king post truss. And then the bearing points are at the edge. Somebody might ask you about that at some point. They also remember that three hinged arch we were talking about. And I said, you could do this in a truss as well as a glue lamb beam. They've got that there. Now they also talk about a scissors truss. You got that scissors truss. Now, when you're talking about a scissors truss, there's a scissors warren, and there's another one. So here's one right here. Here's the scissors truss. What you have to realize is there's no straight bottom cord. What does that mean? That means that these bearing points can you can develop movement because they're not rigidly 
connected together with a bottom cord. So a scissors truss can develop movement at its bearing points. And it tells us that right here in the walkers somewhere. Let's see if we can find it. Let's see if we can find it. The scissors truss, blah, 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 the bottom of page 656 of the 31 edition, 31st edition. Because there is no horizontal bottom cord or tie between the bearing points, the scissor truss develops movement at its bearing points when under a load. The designer should anticipate this and so on and so forth. There's some other real interesting stuff in here. You can't take this in, and I've seen him ask questions about this. Ah. Uh, Oh, man. Um, but that's really the most thing that you need to know. You need to know a little bit about the King Trust. You need to know about the Scissors Trust. You need to know this three-hinged arch. The rest of that is, uh, it, you know, you probably are not going to have to be responsible for. Okay, very good. So we'll put that, uh, put that walkers away. That's about it on trusses. All right, wood trusses. There's some information, obviously. Yeah, about bracing trusses and the BCSI, all right, the truss manual, we call it. You got to, now if it's about tr bracing a truss, you know, you've got to go to the, the, the BCSI manual, the truss book. If it's about styles of trusses, you're going to go to this book, okay, the principles and practices of commercial construction. And then we're going to look, one last thing, I want you to know there's a glossary here. Sometimes these glossaries are great reference uh, manuals, you know, great, you know, great references for you. The, 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 uh, the, because just right here, you know what a Pascal is. All right. You know, what are they talking about? Pascal? Oh, okay. Here you go. Now I know what it is. What is a metric ton? Hey, you know, the ton, by the way, is 2000 pounds. A metric ton is 2200 pounds. Okay. A, um, a, uh, kilogram is 2.2 .2 pounds. So these are things that, may come in handy. All right. Hey, listen, this has been Jack Sheffield, Jack the Exam Guy, taking you through the principles and practices of commercial construction. I've been happy to do it. I appreciate your business. Remember, you're going to be rich and famous one day, or at least rich, okay, when you get your contractor's license. Don't forget about those poor people like me that need a little bit of charity. Give to your church. Give to, uh, give to a charity. Wounded Warriors, Tunnels to Towers. Okay, St. Jude's Hospital, Shriners Hospital, give a little bit back. Thank you so much. I appreciate you listening.